Mm. I'm sure there's a reason why I, I uh, uh, filled in this particular cell. And it does lead to the correct solution, so I'm probably right. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so indeed. So the main point I want to make is that um, when you do this, you, you can still make puzzles which are interesting and fun to solve. Uh, I think we had some fun uh, just now. Um, and, uh, and which do lead to maybe more interesting, uh, uh, or they uh, lead to a larger class of possible pictures as solutions than you can make with classical uh, nonograms. Uh, and they also lead to interesting new ways of reasoning uh, while you're solving the puzzle. So I think those are two nice properties uh, which enrich um, the, the nonogram puzzle genre. Um, OK. However, um, there uh, are some uh, uh, things we have to watch out for. So in particular, um, classical nonograms have cells that are all of the same size. And that's a nice property, because if one cell is uh, easy to see, then all of them are easy to see. Uh, however, with slanted nonograms, the cells can have very different sizes. And in particular, it could be that sizes become so small that you cannot see them anymore. Okay. So if I look at uh, uh, an uh, arrangement like this, am I looking at six cells or seven cells? It's not so, so clear. Right, so we don't really want this kind of situation, because it creates ambiguity. And then if you're solving the puzzle, you don't you might misinterpret what's happening. Uh, I also probably don't want lines that are very close to each other, or lines that intersect at a very um, uh, small angle, because then this creates ambi ambiguous uh, situations. Uh, OK, so we don't want these kind of things. Um, another question is, well, if we, uh, even if we don't have those, we might have more than two lines going through the same point, uh, so like this. And OK, so here it is clear which uh, cells there are in the puzzle. But it's maybe not so clear how we would write a clue like this um, for this line here. Uh, because if I walk along this line, then there are two consecutive cells that are colored. But on the other hand, these cells are maybe less consecutive than two cells would be if there would not be three lines going through one point. Yeah? Uh, OK, so I could I have a design choice here. So I could either denote this clue as 1, 1, where I count this empty space in between as um, uh, breaking up the sequence. Um, but it's kind of problematic, because then this clue is not really about the line of faces that touch this line anymore. I also care about the ones in between. But well, if this one would be colored, would I still want to count it uh, or not? Um, or I can, I, I can choose to just consider the sequence of cells that are adjacent to a line oh, as, uh, um, as the sequence that I make a clue about. Okay. So it's not so clear which one is better. Uh, we chose to use this one. Uh, we could also have picked this one. I am not sure um, there, are, there are pros and cons for, for either of these. Um, but what it does mean, I think, is that triple intersections make the puzzle conceptually harder. So it's for a player, um, it's harder to solve a puzzle with triple intersections because that player will have to go through the process of realizing that there's multiple interpretations and uh, realizing which one is the one that's actually used, independent of which choice you make. Okay, so that might be a reason why you might want to avoid triple intersections um, in puzzles. Okay, so we could try to avoid them, but the problem is that uh, it's actually pretty hard to avoid pri uh, triple intersections if you have more than two orientations of lines in a puzzle. And in particular, if we have too many orientations, then uh, we might have a problem anyway. So if I just take a bounded domain and I start adding some random lines, well, then this still looks fine. Uh, the cells are not too small. Well, these are getting a bit small. Oh, this is maybe not 
OK. Um, so if I put in um, more than, let's say, 10 lines of random orientations in a, in a square, then I will get some faces which are too small. Um, just because, uh, uh, well, that's. Uh, You need some structure to avoid small faces. And in particular, if I now try to perturb these lines a bit to get rid of the small faces, so if I have a small face, then I could try to get rid of it either by moving one of the lines away from the face or to move it uh, uh, towards the intersection point of the other lines that form the face. And I can just wiggle things a bit for a while until maybe I have not so many small faces anymore. Um, and then you will see that it converges to a picture like this, which looks much better. I mean, there's maybe some faces which you might still consider too small. But at least it's much better than what we started with. Um, but what you see what happened is two things. First of all, there's all of these points where uh, three or even more lines intersect. So that's what naturally will happen if you try to get rid of these small faces. And the, same th the second thing that you see is that the lines are, well, not quite parallel, but they are starting to cluster in several general directions. Okay, So it's like there's these five directions, and every line more or less follows one of those five directions. So this kind of suggests that if we want to make a good puzzle um, with uh, lines of more than two orientations, maybe we should restrict ourselves to a fixed set of orientations and allow triple interse intersections, because otherwise uh, it might just not be possible to add more than a few lines to the puzzle. OK. So if we do that, well, then the question is, uh, uh, the natural question is, well, what kind of patterns of lines do you get if you have a few orientations and you want um, uh, to make the lines go through the same point? Well, then you get something that we call a grid. So if we use two orientations, then we get uh, a regular grid of horizontal and vertical lines, and we're back where we started. Okay. But we can also do it with more than two orientations. For instance, uh, three orientations. No, four. This is four orientations. Uh, so it's just a, a regular grid, but with the diagonals added. OK. Um, but we can also do it with three orientations. You get something like this. Or five orientations. Then you get something a bit more interesting. Um, or seven orientations. Or, or in principle, any number uh, is possible. Um, and maybe taking a subset of lines from one of these regular grids is a reasonable way of making sure you don't get small faces and you don't, uh, 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 but, but you will get lines going through one point. Okay, so then that leads to a, a question. If I have a, a picture and I want to uh, um, represent it using one of these grids, um, how do we map an image to a grid? And that's actually something that, uh, uh, for which there is a lot of research. So uh, for instance, because uh, fonts have to be displayed on monitors, especially 20 years ago, these monitors are pretty low resolution. So there is uh, a lot of research from that time how to map a shape into a, uh, a set of pixels, which represents it well. Um, but we would like to go beyond two orientations. And also for that, there's some uh, work. So for instance, in uh, cartography, um, you might want to represent the shape of a country by an outline on a grid. Uh, so this is, again, a square grid. But we can also do that with, uh, for instance, an, uh, a grid with four orientations. So this is Australia on different resolutions of a uh, uh, four-direction grid. Um, so this is uh, uh, used in uh, uh, cartography and visualization. Um, but still, the, uh, the general question of what is the best way to map a given image onto a given grid with a certain number of orientations is uh, if, you can, if you're allowed to 
choose the scale of the orientations and the number of lines in order to get the best puzzle? I think that's still an open question. Okay. Um, yeah, so one more thing. Uh, we want that puzzles are solvable. Uh, so they should have only one solution. And uh, maybe they should even be simple. Uh, but there is a problem, namely that if we generate puzzles uh, with uh, multiple lines, um, OK, so this one would be non-unique. But we already saw a non-unique example earlier by mistake. So this is no news for you. Um, uh, the problem is if we uh, make slanted nanograms, then almost always they, bec they become very quickly simple and uniquely solvable and actually way too easy. Um, so uh, this is the puzzle that we saw before. And there's actually many different ways to solve it. It doesn't really matter where you start. You, you will uh, get there. Uh, so one way to avoid that problem is by um, simply leaving out some of the clues. So if I leave out this clue, this puzzle is still uniquely solvable. Uh, or if I leave out those two clues, it's also still uniquely solvable. But if I leave out all three, then it's not. OK, so this is kind of a, a practical way to increase the difficulty of a puzzle, to just start throwing out clues and check whether it's still a simple nonogram. And only when it's uh, about to no longer be uh, simple, then that's your final puzzle. OK. So to conclude about the slanted nanograms, um, so we can adapt nanograms by using lines of multiple orientations. Um, doing this creates new uh, constraints, new geometric constraints, new ways to solve the puzzle. Um, if the puzzle uh, has uh, more than five or six lines, then you should probably restrict the set of orientations to a bounded number. Uh, you will have multiple intersections. There's, uh, even though it's from a design perspective something you might want to avoid, it's not going to uh, work out too bad. Um, and there is an algorithmic uh, challenge here, namely how to map a shape onto a grid. Um, and that's, uh, uh, I think, a very interesting question uh, to do research into. OK. Any questions about the, the slanted version of the nonogram? OK, then let me move on and go a step further. Um, because while well, why would we restrict ourselves to nanograms with straight lines? I mean, I wanted to bleach my puzzles, and those trees are certainly not straight anymore after bleaching. Um, so why not have lines with curvature? Okay. Uh, so this is an uh, arrangement of curves where I can color a set of uh, uh, cells of the arrangement such that this forms a picture. and OK, so with slanted uh, uh, lines, I could make a nice house with a straight uh, uh, but slanted roof. Now I can even make things like trees, which have curves. OK? OK, in principle, no problem. I can just do this. Um, and I can still use the same uh, way to give clues as for my slanted nonograms. I can follow one of these curves and just count the adjacent cells. Um, yeah, And uh, the uh, advantage is that if I have curved lines, then I might be able to just always avoid those triple intersections. Because if I'm about to hit an intersection, I just make a little detour and no more intersection. OK. Um, problem is that uh, uh, the potential for ambiguity uh, is also increasing. So first of all, there's the geometric ambiguity. Uh, if I have two curves that are coming very close to each other and then either crossing or, or almost touching, I cannot really tell which curve is which. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the other case. Um, or if curves 
go somewhere and then do something very local that I cannot really see without squinting, then that's probably also not, uh, not good. Uh, so I want to avoid uh, these kinds of situations. Uh, but also, um, there's other uh, considerations that we didn't really have before. Namely, if I'm allowed to use curved uh, lines, then I have the risk that the solution of the puzzle is going to be visible by just looking at the puzzle. Uh, so for the slanted, for the classical nanograms, you certainly don't see the solution if you look at the puzzle because it's just a grid. For the slanted ones, uh, I think you still don't really see it because it's a bunch of lines. But maybe for this puzzle, I'm going to ask you to guess the solution. Anyone? A house, very good, yes. Uh, so how do you know? You, the, the clues are not even visible yet. Yeah, so, cl so clearly the house consists of straight lines, but the lines are uh, turned into curves, which are very wiggly, and, and they look just different. So by just looking at it in, in one instance, you see the house in this arrangement of curves. Uh, OK, so there it is. Um, and the problem is the curves that we added are not similar to the curves from the original picture. So we apparently want some kind of similarity there. Uh, but what do we mean by that, and how do we measure that? It's not so clear. Um, another question, a design question, is whether you want the input image to be exactly the solution of the puzzle, or you're allowed to change it a little bit. Okay, so if this is the image that I want uh, my puzzle to generate, then um, well, I can identify somehow the uh, the angles, the, the vertices, the sharp angles of the boundary of my shape. And this gives me three curves. And one thing I can do is just continue these three curves in both directions. Uh, or I could say, well, it's also fine if I have some other curves such that the solution is kind of similar to my picture, but it might have vertices in different places. OK, so if I am not allowed to alter the picture that makes sure that the final image is really what I want. Um, but if I do allow to alter it, then it gives more freedom to maybe uh, avoid ambiguous situations, like uh, to curves here. Maybe they make a very sharp angle here, which is one of the situations I wanted to avoid. If I'm enforcing that, then I cannot avoid it anymore. Um, uh, and maybe it actually also helps if the image changes a little bit because it becomes harder to see the output image in the input arrangement. So that's another design question that you have to uh, solve. Uh, and then there's another question, namely, um, what about curves that intersect themselves? Okay, so that's something we didn't have with uh, slanted nanograms. But here we can have it. So this might be a, uh, a nanogram where there is a curve which intersects itself. And if this is the solution image that I want, well, what is now going to be the clue? So if I uh, go around this uh, curve, how many colored faces do I encounter? Okay. So again, there's two possible ways to interpret this. You could say, well, there's only one colored face. So clearly, I encounter only one. Or you could say, well, if I walk along this line, then I encounter this face, and then this face, and then this face, and then this face, and then this face. So that's not colored, colored, not colored, colored, not colored. So the clue should be I encounter two times a colored face uh, sequence of length one. Okay, And so again, it's not so clear what is the, uh, uh, the best way to deal with this. I think this one is easier to uh, generalize, because here you say, well, there's only one phase, so you should have only one one. But what if something happens between the two times you encounter it? Then you get things in ambiguous orders. Uh, so I think this one makes more sense. But as with the case of triple intersections, the main um, message is that for a solver of the puzzle, 
um, self intersections make the puzzle conceptually harder because as a solver, you have to think about this and think about, okay, what does it actually mean? What happens when you have self intersections? So for that reason, just like triple intersections, you might also want to avoid self intersections. Okay. Um, so, how do we uh, generate curved uh, nanograms? Well, there's many different ways in which you could do this. So one thing that we did uh, um, with uh, um, one student project, uh, actually that student is sitting in the audience and he's now a PhD student, um, is uh, to say, well, let's try to um, take the uh, ends of our curves and generate new curves from those ends and let's take random Bezier curves uh, to start with. So then you get something like this where we may have many very small faces that are uh, hard to uh, or that are very ambiguous or you have sharp angles in the curves that you don't really want. So many local situations that are not good. Uh, and now let's just uh, try to optimize this by picking one of these curves and uh, trying to replace it by a different curve which extends from the same point, like this one maybe. We just randomly picked a different one. Um, and maybe it's better and then I keep it in the different location. And I pick a new one and I try to replace it. Uh, and another one which I try to replace. Okay, so maybe this one was actually worse than the one I started with so I don't change it. And so you can just try to run this process, um, right? And you can imagine doing this more cleverly than just uh, so having a yes-no uh, decision by using uh, simulated annealing or um, uh, some kind of evolutionary approach. Um, and then after a while, you would hope that the picture, well, the puzzle becomes uh, a bit better. So I think it's now a bit better than the one we started with. Um, but you can imagine if you do this maybe not 10 times, but a million times, then uh, you would see more results. Um, however, you can only do this if you somehow know what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so we need somehow a way to measure